conversation today. I quickly just wanted to make you all aware of some great resources offered by career and professional development. So as you can see in my background, my virtual background is for the Pride, which is a new portal that connects students with alumni for mentorship, career support. And I know that it's probably frowned upon to bring out a phone during a panel, but if you wanna quickly get that QR code, that'll take you directly to the Pride. And students, staff, alumni, if you haven't activated your profile on the Pride, this is a great way for you to connect with individuals who are working in the spaces such as those we're going to explore today and start exploring those different career pathways. And I also just wanted to plug for the students in the room our government and nonprofit education career week coming up next week. We have alumni networking panels, a virtual career fair. So I will drop that link in the chat as well. And I'm always here for any of you that might be curious about CPD and what we offer. So I'll send my email as well for students, alumni, faculty, staff to reach out. And again, I'm really grateful for this partnership with Julia and the Bellarmine Forum. And I will turn it over to Julia now to kick us off. Thanks so much, Liz. I really appreciate it. Welcome again, everyone. Um, I have been doing restorative practices work in collaboration with the Restorative Justice Project in the Center for Urban Resilience on our campus at LMU since 2018. And I'd like to offer thanks again to Liz and Career and Professional Development for their partnership on this event. And this is also a joint effort with LMU's annual Bellarmine Forum, um, for which the theme this year is Building Transformative Justice Where We Stand and aims to facilitate a deeper understanding of theories of justice and their relationship to perspectives on punishment. And I would like to thank the Student EXP Practice Ignatian Values Pillar Committee in Student Affairs and Chelsea Brown in particular for the work on this event. And we're joined by three amazing panelists today. Um, and so for our program, we're gonna start with some questions that I'm gonna offer. Um, and then we're going to open it up to hear from you all for any questions that you might have. And we will be recording um, to make this available to folks who weren't able to join us. We'll record this first portion only and then shut it off for the Q&A. And so without further ado, I, I would just like to jump in and share a little bit more about, um, you know, who's given their afternoons to be with us today. So um, first, Becky uh, Bex Sarahi Montez, she, hers, Ella, was born in Los Angeles, grew up in Glendale and Pasadena, and is the daughter of migrants from Mexico City. And she is a restorative justice specialist in the California Conference for Equality and Justice, where she provides intensive facilitation of conflict transformation and relationship building processes for young people, families, workplaces, and communities using restorative justice practices. And she holds an MSW from the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor, a BA in psychology from UC Berkeley, and an AS in natural sciences from Pasadena City College. Bex has held various roles in Southern California and Southern Michigan, walking along, alongside others as they engage in change, healing, and relationship building practices that nurture individual and community well-being. And she's served in mentorship roles to adolescents and graduate students, as a facilitator supporting dialogue, skill development, and anti-oppression education for undergraduate and graduate students, and as a holistic mental wellness therapist, primarily serving Black and non-Black people of color. So thank you, um, Bex, for being here today. And then Jerron Williams began working in Pasadena, California at grassroots nonprofits, such as Teen Futures, Outward Bound Adventures, and Neighbors Acting Together, Helping All. He supported students and families in the financial aid department for two years at Pasadena City College, facilitating workshops and connecting students with work study programs. In 2008, he volunteered to become an AmeriCorps member with Playwork Southern California and found his true passion for facilitating social emotional learning through play. He stayed with the Play Playworks organization for an additional five years and he was a coach and regional manager helping to reshape and transform school communities throughout Los Angeles, Inglewood, and Pasadena. 
Duran transitioned to citizens of the World Charter Schools in the fall of 2014 and has been supporting social emotional development implementation, student programming, and staff development across the CWC LA region. He's currently the director of social emotional learning at CWC Silver Lake TK through fifth campus and regional director of student programs. So thanks so much, John, welcome. And then Sophia Espinoza serves as a research and policy associate in, at Fair and Just Prosecution. And she previously served as the managing director of special projects at the UCLA Latino Policy and Politics Initiative. Uh, LPPI, where she managed external partnerships and supported the organization's policy and development portfolios. Sophia was also a Monica Salinas Policy Fellow at LLP, LPPI, where she managed the organization's criminal justice research projects, including an inquiry into California's arrest rates, and led a partnership with Latino Justice on criminal justice reform in Latinos. While working as a research and policy analyst for UCLA's Million Dollar Hoods project, she conducted research on women brought into the justice system. Before graduate school, Sophia worked at a New Way of Life reentry project, a nonprofit that helps formerly incarcerated women access support services in South Los Angeles. Sophia received her master's of public policy from UCLA's Luskin School of Public Affairs and proudly holds a BA, I'm adding that, in political science and women's studies from Loyola Marymount University. So welcome Sophia, Jaron, and Bex. And so with that, um, I know we did this introduction, but to start us off, I'm, I would really love it if you would describe your current work, your path toward your work, if you wanna make it a little personal for us, maybe tell us a story. Um, so tell us about you know, what you're doing, your path to that work, and also really what you see as the purpose of the work that you're doing. Um, and who's ever ready to start, please go ahead. All right. I can, oh, go ahead, John. I'll go first. Um, so my path to the work is definitely uh, in a uh, in a unique way. Uh, the way I start to even work with youth or get into this field was definitely through um, a court order. Um, when I went to school in Idaho University, I came across uh, some police officers that um, were not helping an individual citizen or whatnot. And in that, in that situation, um, I was arrested and accused of a lot of different things. And through that process, although it wasn't the greatest, um, I was court order to go back to my community and serve, being that I was a graduate, I was graduating that year and all that good stuff. And I came back and started to volunteer to commit to commit to my community service and really start to work with youth in my community. And in that work, someone saw something in me as a 23 year old male, fresh out of college and said that I had a connection with youth. Um, and in uh, getting outdoors with kids and doing things that I'd never even had an opportunity to do in the out of school world um, and in the community, as a, as a child, now being able to do it as a volunteer um, in the community, it really, it really helped me find my passion of working within the community um, and really giving back. Um, although the route to getting to that experience wasn't the best, uh, that experience is what kicked off my ability to want to be more engaged um, in the community and work with youth um, of all ages and, and in the community with a lot of different organizations. Um, I did forget some of your, your second question, but uh, if you can kind of give me another, but that's why I do the work that I do so far, so. Yeah, thank you, John. Um, thank you so much for sharing. And just could you talk more about what you see as the purpose of the work that you're doing now? Yeah, so uh, as a social emotional learning director um, at an elementary school and then student programs director overall, um, my focus and my lens in hiring a lot of different individuals, young adults, I manage, I manage teacher associates uh, who really deliver SEL curriculum um, and engagement with our students. And as you will know, the, the world is, is ever evolving in, in times of this, um, it's, it's, it's really um, evolving in ways to where we all have to be a, a lot more responsible and a lot more mindful of not only what's happening now, but our actions in the past and where we want our actions to take us in the future. Um, in this work, in this current time, 
um, and even prior to this, there's been a big drive into to bring true diversity into organizations, into the spaces that I occupy. Um, and through that, I've been able to support our staff members in hiring more people of color, uh, people that really uh, resemble the communities we want to build and resemble LA as a whole. And through that, the work in SEL has really brought about rich conversations and action, not only within students, but staff and, not, and now the parent community. And I see the strength in that work is the language that we all use and norm across on having deeper dialogue to benefit not only uh, the students, but our community as a whole, meaning all stakeholders, students, parents, as well as staff. Um, and I think that's the biggest piece and the biggest part of, I think, restorative practices is being the proactive piece of it, right? I'm not really the, the harm has been caused and now doing the other part, but really creating the environment to where those conversations can be held, norming on language in which we can all utilize and implement to better support people getting their voice heard and out and also doing it in a productive, a productive way that is gonna bring the community as a whole to a stronger point together, so. That's what I think is the biggest piece of the, the elements of the work that I hold. I can go next. Um, hi, I'm Sophia. Um, it's really great to be here with you all, um, especially at LMU. It's nice to see so many former mentors and former classmates here. So thanks for having me. Um, my path to restorative justice, honestly, I, I owe it to LMU. Um, I took a women's studies course my senior year um, where my professor kind of taught us about restorative justice. And I was honestly skeptical at first. Um, I kind of had a pretty black and white view of the criminal justice system. And it really wasn't until she brought in individuals who had been through a restorative justice program on both sides and were kind of able to talk about how they had grown and healed through that process that I kind of started to understand um, the benefits of it. And then I did a year of service when I graduated through Ignatian Service Corps. Um, and I was placed at a New Way of Life Reentry Project, which is in Watts and helps formerly incarcerated women get housing and support services. And I kind of, I understood, I, I began to learn the experiences of women and men who were formerly incarcerated. And I really saw firsthand how restorative justice could have spared them many years in prison and could have spared them a lot of trauma and could have really actually helped them through the healing process instead. Um, so it really is because of LMU's emphasis on service and being in community with directly impacted individuals, I think that kind of made me understand um, the impact that restorative justice can have. And now I work at Fair and Just Prosecution. Um, we work with reform-minded district attorneys and attorneys general throughout the country to kind of rethink the scope of the criminal justice system. Um, and, you know, my daily work definitely focuses more so on broader criminal justice issues, but we do encourage the district attorneys and AGs that we work with to utilize restorative justice programs, you know, as a way to avoid system involvement and as a way to reduce the criminal justice footprint. I was gonna go ahead, Julia, are you gonna share something? No, that's great, thanks. So I was just gonna say thank you and invite you, Bex, please. Yeah, thank you. This, uh, it's so nice to be with everyone and I appreciate just learning more about Sophia and Jaren too. Uh, so my current role, I work at CCJ, like Julia shared, my title is Restorative Justice Specialist. And I think just to introduce myself, I, I wanna say like, I see myself as a lifelong student in this work. So I have issues with my title saying specialist, but I just am a student, right, of this, always studying this work and getting to do it too in an everyday capacity. So I support youth who have been diverted out of the system, right, into a diversion program, and we're operating through a restorative justice-based lens. And we operate, right? We have restorative justice processes with the youth who are diverted and also with the folks, right, that were impacted by whatever the incident was. So we try to bring all the folks together. 
And my path to this work, so similar to Sophia, started for me when I was in college. I was also in a class that shifted everything for me, just really challenged me to face or confront what I had learned to take for granted or what I had learned to take as um, natural and normal, right? The way that justice is defined for us uh, as something that can be achieved through punishment, through the punitive system, through isolation, through dehumanization, right? And so in this class, I think that completely transformed me to understand that actually this system, like the core of the system is anti-Blackness and that white supremacy and anti-Blackness are the things that benefit, right? When we just blindly accept that this is what justice looks like. And I was also introduced to restorative justice in that space. And when I graduated, was lucky to find CCEJ and to become a volunteer with them. So my time with CCEJ started as a volunteer for a couple of years, supporting youth on cases. Um, and yeah, I think I might, might be forgetting a question. <laughs> Is there anything else more about like your purpose and the purpose in your work um, and how that's manifesting for you? Uh, so I think one piece of that sits with me, I guess, around purpose is just what are ways that we can create different conditions for, for some folks, right? For the youth that are being um, targeted by these systems, this is one way that their conditions can shift, right? Instead of continuing within that system, right? Being targeted by that system, we can shift folks out of that. And like people before me had mentioned, that is an opportunity, right? For people's lives to flourish, right? In different ways, instead of to be dehumanized and to have opportunities taken away. So that sits with me because I wanna say that this is not a solution, right? But I think we can shift some conditions while we're continuing to strive for a bigger vision of liberation. So that's one piece. Um, that sits at my heart. Thank you, Bex, and thank you all for sharing. And some of you already touched on a little piece, right, of what you just shared, Bex, and then Sophia with your kind of definition and scope changing. But I'm wondering about if you can talk more about what justice means to you, what it means in your work, and maybe that is specifically talking about restorative justice. And then how did you get there? How did you get to this? definition. So I don't know if you would be willing to start back. So just like expanding upon what you were sharing, and especially with this idea of two being a lifelong learner and, and, and things evolving. Yeah, <laughs> I think like, I was sitting with this question earlier, and it feels I feel like the weight of it, or it feels like a big question. Um, but I also think that that is important as folks that are in this space, and we're holding the RJ work, right, to always be asking, like, what does justice mean to us? Um, and so for me right now, what's coming to mind is facing and challenging, right, the systems of oppression. So it's, yes, for me and my role, I'm supporting folks within an incident, a specific incident of harm that happened, but there are systemic roots to that harm. So rather than individualizing um, harm, really naming what are these systems that are perpetuating all of these types of harm that are happening in our community and calling that out and like challenging and transforming that. So, and so I, I guess I see it as like a dual project, like we're trying to take that down, all of these systems of oppression down while also building like what um, Mariam Kaba would call like life affirming institutions and systems. So that is what's sitting for me as justice. Um, and Julia, you may have asked another question and I forgot. <laughs> yeah, just is there anything more, I mean, because that's beautiful. And is there anything more that you can share about, um, you know, it's, it's apparent to me how that shows up in your work, but what does it mean in your work and how, yeah. how you carry that with you as, you know, your work is evolving or then you're learning new things about what justice can mean for you and for others. I, I think I want to connect then how is RJ like a piece of this, right? Like liberation experiment or project. And I think it's just one tool, like one tool that can support us to reimagine how we can create safety with one another in community. 
um, because it's a relational, it's a way of being, right? It's not just like a skill or it's not just an intervention, but it restorative practices are a way of being. So the way that I connect it to justice overall is thinking about how we can practice this on an everyday basis. Like how can we invite accountability um, into our everyday lives and just continuing to practice that with one another. Thank you. Jaron, are you ready to talk to us about justice? RJ, what does it mean in your work? Justice, How are you there now? I'm gonna be straight up. Justice is a word that I think I can't relate to um, because I am a black male in black skin living in white America. So justice is a word I would stray away from, but I think accountability is a piece that I think needs to live in a lot of different areas of the system, um, as well as in a lot of different structures and systems. But I think the the essence of restorative practices um, is is really like um, I'm sorry, like Bex was talking about, is really establishing those community norms, right? Um, and in those community norms, there's accountability, there's guide rails, there's 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 boundaries and there's structures for every community or every every household or whatever it may be. Um, and there's common themes that need to be um, adjusted to meet individuals where they are, but also allow flexibility for mistakes to happen. And I think that's one thing we have to all understand is that there's there's different levels of accountability based on understanding and experience, right? Um, and what are the what are the frameworks in which we can um, meet people where they are, hold them accountable, but bring them to where the community or where we as a as who have the same goal need them to be to help us excel together as as a unit or as a community, and I think that's where I really think restorative practices for me lives in my work, especially working with younger kids who just don't know everything yet, right? And and, and even parents, I'm finding that just don't know uh, their blind spots, right? Um, and adults as well. I've been hit with a lot of blind spots in leadership positions and having to understand how to just use certain words in certain situations to bring people along and, and build them up, but also hold them accountable, right? Um, so I think that's what restorative practice allows allows me to do in the work is to be proactive in setting up some of these structures and taking down some of the systems and looking through how to hold people accountable, but also welcome people in to the joy of it all, right? Because in it all, there's joy. There's joy when you see someone make a better choice next time. There's joy when you see someone encourage someone to make a better choice before they make a poor choice. So I know I'm talking like, this might be elementary, junior high for some of y'all, but it really resonates also with adults and, and the practice doesn't just stop with how old you get, right? It's something that we always continue to develop and, and, and continue to build on as human beings. Um, but I, I, found that, I found that truth in working with youth and now I'm applying that to adults and it's still the same results of, of, of teamwork, of success and of growth. Um, and that's the piece though, I think so restorative practice is something I use, not so much restorative justice. So that's just something I would just communicate. So. Thank you, Jaron. And I don't know if this resonates with you, but something in my kind of, you know, investigation learning around this too, is sometimes with restorative practices, there's like an unlearning of ways that we've been, um, I don't know, institutionalized or trained to think about things. Does that make sense to you at all? Or is, would that be, you know, something that you would, would make sense to you? For sure, unlearning is a big piece. Uh, I we just started a community a parent group where they're now launching into affinity groups. Like parents in our community are doing this work, um, and there's a lot of unlearning. Not and it's just not just you know for uh, people of a certain identity marker, but there's things we all need to unlearn, and there's things we all need to start to. I mean, some groups more than others for sure, depending on the blind spots. But there are elements of unlearning things to then grow together as a community. Again, it has to go back to us and not just me or a subgroup. It has to go to the community as a whole. And I think that's the biggest piece missing of the within these systems is the, the ability to unlearn. But first you have to know what you need to unlearn, right? And those aren't written in these history books. <laughs> those aren't readily available to people to find out what they need to unlearn about their own identities because our, a lot of people's identities have been hidden, right? Um, and I think that goes across all identity markers, so. 
Thank you, Sophia. Open invitation to you to talk to us a little bit about justice, what that means for you, um, how you got there, anything else that you'd like to share. Yeah, definitely. Um, well, I definitely agree with everything that Bex and Jaron have said. I think it's also really critical to have an intersectional approach when you're thinking about justice, right? And thinking about how race and socioeconomic status and gender and immigration status really interplay to deny people the justice that they deserve. And I think personally, I've kind of come to that or my definition of my understanding of justice being um, biracial and my mom is white, my dad is Mexican. And, you know, growing up and wondering why is my dad getting stopped by the police just for being a six foot one Mexican man, but I've never seen that happen to my white mom, right? And so kind of obviously didn't have the context for that when I was young, um, but growing up and kind of understanding it more and seeing like family members going through it and like the sim similar situations, you kind of get to realize, hey, there's, there's something going on here. And I think that pivoting back to my work at FJP, I think that's something that I'm really proud of what we do is, you know, we, a lot of the district attorneys and attorneys general that we work with are coming from similar backgrounds, right? Like as Jaron said, it's, you're actually kind of taking a step back and saying, is there even, do I really have like a feeling of justice um, in this space? You know, like there's, you know, one of the DAs that we work with, his father has been incarcerated for his entire life. Um, some of the other DAs, you know, are first women, black women, of uh, Mexican women of color. Um, and I think having that lens and really understanding firsthand, you know, how you've been denied justice throughout your life can really serve elected officials well when you're trying to, you know, do the best for your community because you, you have that firsthand understanding whether or not it's been a positive or negative experience. Anything else sparked for anyone before we move on to the next question? Great. So Bex, I'm going to kick this to you because we kind of, you know, in co-creating questions, we're really thinking about this. Um, is restorative practices a career field? And if we're talking about it as such, is, is that problematic? Or, you know, what, what should be the context of this work um, and how we're thinking about it maybe largely as a way of being like you were describing it? Thanks, Julia. And I'm also, I think the way of hearing, like, is it a field of work is sitting with me. And as somebody that has a role, right, an employed position doing, doing RJ, like in a nonprofit, I feel like I, there are things that I want to name because I think that's important for any of us who are employed doing this work. And something that I sit with is that we acknowledge um, that restorative practices are rooted in indigenous knowledge, right? And ways of being from forever. So this is important because now they're being situated within this context in this society, which is founded, I mean, for the US, right? On white supremacy, on colonization. Um, so what does that mean <laughs> that this these roles are now situated, right? These roles that come from indigenous communities are now situated within this context um, because those ways of being are not com compatible, right? With the world that we have right now um, with the dominant or supremacist ideologies that we have right now. So I feel like we have to really reckon with that. Um, and I think in a lot of roles too, we're asked to focus only on like the immediate the present day like harm, right? In my role, I'm asked to focus on like this specific incident that happened in 2020, right? Um, but also RJ, I feel like calls on us to think about the historical harms too. Um, and so wanting to say like, where is, how do we step into that, right? Into, into addressing those historical harms. Um, so I think as RJ practitioners, that's also something that I'm encouraging or that at least for me, I feel like I really do need to sit with and think about and not forget. Um, yeah, and I think the other pieces 
that this is for everyone, right? And I'm thinking about what's the risk when we professionalize RJ. Uh, we, I think the risk is like saying it's these people from the outside that have to come into like this scenario in a community, right? That it's not the folks within that community that have the skills to do that. And so I think that is what I worry about or what I, yeah, what my concern is with like professionalizing these roles, which is really just skills that anyone can hold that folks already hold that we just need more practice with and that it's folks in those local spaces that are best, the ones to best support with um, navigating conflict. And I wouldn't want for it to feel like, no, it's only folks from the outside that have to travel to another state or go to another county, right? So those are some things that I think about. Thanks, Bex. Jaron, what are your thoughts on this idea of restorative practices as a career, the problems with this? And I know you were kind of making a distinction earlier between RJ and restorative practices. And I also wondered if this would be a time for you to speak like a little bit more to that, if you're comfortable with that. Uh, yeah, I think I think it's everything. Bex is like spot on. Like I'm just following up. <laughs> like, you know, I, I think I think it's woven, right? I think there's a lot of different roles that can use an expert in restorative justice or restorative practices, right? Like you talk about your DEI directors, your directors of diversity, equity, and inclusion. You talk your your deans of culture. You got all these different things where these practices are woven into everything that they do. Um, like Bex was saying, the, these there's people in every organization or every school that have some of these these elements of the practice. They just don't know what it is. They just don't know how to um, fully flush that out and make it a norm in their community or in their with on their within their team and i think that's the piece that we have to think through is like we are people who do this work are needed but again like beck says we're not needed at the end when there's harm <laughs> we're needed to be proactive to implement these structures and these systems that go against the dominant systems or cultures or colonization mindset to then continue to help communities grow. And when I say communities, those are businesses. Communities are everything, right? Households, this is everything depending on how your brain thinks, but I'm not talking about just one subset of community. It's needed in everything. And I think um, it goes back to professional development, um, which <laughs> Bex seems like that's what a lot of calls you get is consulted and things of that nature. But it's really, you know, someone has to teach, right? Because it is not a norm. It is something that's not um, ingrained in a lot of different uh, systems. Um, and I think that's what needs to happen first. And I know there's a careers out there, consultants and all these, because I learned from them. Um, but it's like, how do you, um, how do you just not, for, for people that are looking for a job, don't just look for a restorative justice job, look for a job that you know you can put your practices and implement them in within that role. Um, and I think that's how you find value and you find growth within yourself, but then you grow communities, right? I think people in this work, <clears throat> their work is growing communities and not just tackling harm when it occurs, so. Thank you. Yeah, and to that end, is that is, is that connected to your thoughts on RJ versus restorative practices or is there anything you want to speak on with that piece right now? So restorative justice to me is like, when it's like how to navigate the after effect of someone already having harm right and then how how to build up on that and 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 to you know then implement struck certain pieces to where you can grow through that um and support all those right because harm is not just the one who view, is viewed to be harm but also the one inflicting harm as i'm sure all of you know but it's the practice of it restorative practices is creating structures to when people are comfortable to sit down and really get to the restorative justice piece, right? Creating norms and systems um, to where people feel comfortable and have trust instilled in their relationships amongst them, their community members to get to that point to really be in a restorative justice moment to where they're really trying to restore something. You can't restore something. I can't just throw you in a room and say, hey, I'm a moderate and then you're gonna, they're like, gonna feel uncomfortable, especially when they don't like the person across from them. You know, the parents might hate each other. Like that's another element, right? There's all these different elements that I think um, the restorative practices support us getting to the end result to say we're actually practicing resort. We're actually implementing restorative justice in that moment, you know? I hope that makes sense for everybody. I don't know. 
hopefully that makes sense but yeah you have to have that foundation and that starts with the trust um exactly you know again what you're saying makes complete sense to me and others can follow up with questions we're going to get to that in just a minute if there is follow-up from that so thank you um Sophia did you have any thoughts that you want to share about um how this might come up in your work or anything related to this idea of you know, making restorative justice and practices a career and potential issues? Yeah, I would definitely pivot a little bit because my work is more kind of in criminal justice reform more in general than restorative justice. But I would say that the same issues occur a lot of the time. I think that anytime that you're working in criminal justice reform and you get too attached to any kind of reform, you know, you're going to, you're going to have to hopefully detach yourself from that at some point if we're gonna get to where we wanna get to, right? Which is, you know, a very different looking criminal justice system than we currently have, right, if anything. Um, and I think that it is interesting when thinking about working with elected officials because um, you, you really do wanna have like a firm foundation with the community, right? And I, I think that working, having DAs working in restore or having some kind of restorative justice practices, you know, you definitely wanna separate that because historically there's a lot of distrust within, especially communities of color in prosecutors offices and elected officials offices and working and leaning on the community who has a much better, you know, pulse on the constituents is, is a way to, to to shrink you know the criminal justice system and so i think that's really critical thank you sophia 